one of the images that was that I grew up with and is still hacked into my brain is the image of the lash scars on my father's back and neck. Um, every time he would step out of the bathroom, a beige towel, you know, covering his lower body, and he would go upstairs to his room, I would see those those persisting marks. And every time it felt like a cold sliver would pierce my stomach, but but I never talked about those. I mean, nobody did. I had also overheard that my uncles had similar whiplash scars on their bodies, but this was an open secret, some, but something that everybody knew, but nobody talks about. Talking was dangerous. It still is. It's a dangerous business. Um, the most frightening thing was visiting my aunt's house because their walls were covered by the pictures of young men with their piercing looks, seven of them dead, each and every one of them executed by the Iranian government. And why were these men tortured and killed and imprisoned? Because they were Kurdish and they wanted to be Kurdish meaning that they didn't want to assimilate and put aside their identity. And that's not an insignificant crime in Iran. I guess you now understand why my generation, the generation before me, the one after me, we have all grown up illiterate in our mother tongues. I don't know how much you can relate to it, but I die to read Kazi's stories, and I can't. When you're grown up illiterate in your mother tongue, you're inevitably disconnected from your own history, your own literature, and your own stories. It shouldn't surprise you that Kurdish cities were among the poorest in Iran, and a summary execution isn't enough, that we have to ha suffer from linguicide, from cultural genocide, from economic crisis, and everything else. But at the same time, there were people that I would see on the TV that they looked so different from us, from the Kurds. They looked, they looked so well off, so sophisticated. They were the ones who had good schools, great books, well-equipped hospitals. They were Persians, the dominant group um, who didn't know much about us, even though we knew so much about them. Um, but interesting thing is they could also be incarcerated and tortured if they spoke up against the government. The other part of the story was that I also learned that Kurds weren't only a 7 million population living in Iran, that to our west, to our north, and to our south, there were other people who, who spoke like us or a branch of our language who lived like us, dressed like us, danced like us. And they were Kurdish, but the borders said that they were Iraqis, Syrian, and Turkish. They were all descendants of the Indo-European Medes, and um, they have all been living in the land called Kurdistan, but that land now belongs to three other countries. And as you know, all very peaceful and humanitarian, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. Like ours, their villages were destroyed, their fathers were tortured, their brothers were sent to fire squad. But if I were to associate with them, to sympathize with them, I would be considered a betrayer, a separatist, an anti-Iranian person. And un that's an unacceptable crime if you ever sympathize with the Kurds who live on the other side of the border. So it was, a, and it still is, a complicated and a tough situation. Um, but once I reached a teenage, when, once, when I, once I was a teenager, I realized that Kurdishness wasn't the only problem. In fact, I thought, I wish Kurdishness was the only problem. Hey, I was also a woman. Like, how bad can it get? <laughs> um, I don't need to tell you, you've heard and you're going to hear more throughout this week how women in Iran are officially considered 
anything, not, not a human, with no right to divorce, to custody, to, to leave the country without permission, to leave, to get a job without the husband's permission. But to what extent do people actually apply those rules into their everyday life? and how women respond to that situation. Because that's where West goes wrong, right? Those laws exist, but how many men apply them and to what extent? Um, that's something that you can get the answer of in, in the book, Echoes from the Other Land. So what am I to do? I mean, what are you and I to do if we don't want to turn a blind eye to the atrocities committed around us. How are we to read the bitter narrative of this world? Is this happened to my father and her mother and all the other people? Is this, is this part of a bigger narrative that can give context, offer meaning, even some justification? In this world of conflict, contradiction, when we are faced with the sublime and with the hideous, how are we to face these complications, adapt, and yet again regain the eagerness to move on towards creating a better place? How? Literature and art became my haven, my shelter, my hope, and my solve. Every time I listened to Shahram Nazari's songs or read a story, I felt a little bit less bitter and angry and a little bit more forgiving and compassionate. I believe that the artist and the writer, they, they disrobe the fully dolled up universe. They cultivate our senses by, because they expose the magnificent, <coughs> sorry. The magnificence, the magnificence and the repugnant. Literature humanizes the other and they encourage us to reflect. Literature fuels us to become human and to stay humane. Writing has been and is a necessity in my life. Its beauty and the uplifting literature, power of literature, its power to humanize matters to me. Um, Writing is my therapy. Writing is something that offers a little bit of meaning to my existence. It's something that I can use to reflect, to discover, and also to experience a lot of joy. So after having lived with journals and stories since grade five, Echoes from the Other Land was born into this world and went on to become a nominee for national and international awards. Some Canadian literary journals published my book, and actually one of my stories went all the way to England when it was published in an anthology of short stories that were inspired by photography. The anthology is called Still, and is published by Negative Press, London. Now, you know this negative is not the opposite of positive, right? You know what this negative is. Another great thing that happened to me this summer was um, being published by Novel Rights. They are an innovative human right e-publication house. They utilize the power of literature to promote human rights. Um, and that's the story I'm going to read for you. Um, I also just finished a semi-presentable draft of a, a really hefty project. It's a historical novel. For now, I call it um, many cunning passages, but who knows what publishers would have in mind. Um, I also started a nonfiction project while publishers and agents are busy reading and making changes. It's, uh, it's a new and endearing experience to write nonfiction. This is the memoir of a Kurdish woman who was in prison at age 16 by the Iranian government. She was trapped in an abusive relationship after she, um, she was released from prison. She escaped Iran as a refugee, and now she lives in Toronto as an activist helping other refugees. I think her life story is amazing. But the reason I chose her is because I think she's a live witness to all the massacre that happened in Kurdistan, in Sanandaj, in the 18s, when Khomeini had just taken over. Um, 
So the piece that I'm going to read for you now is called The Lullaby. It's based on a true story. It's the story of a Kurdish poet, journalist, and teacher called Farzad Kamanger. Um, some people here know them in person. He spent time with them in cell. He, um, he was uh, charged with animosity towards God, whatever that means. And uh, one of his crimes was secretly teaching his students the Kurdish alphabet. The lullaby. Can I have that? My pad, sorry. Thank you. And why is it not working? <laughs> The lullaby. I tell myself that my students are still learning in secret the history of the Kurds. The call for prayer echoes through Evan prison turns me cold with fear. Footsteps. I know the sound of those heavy boots. I know them well. My pen falls from my bed and I curl into a ball, shrinking with fear. The pain in my head and face, leg and back, stomach and ribs, becomes much sharper. Clutching at the pillow does not help, does not prevent me from shaking. The footsteps stop before they reach my ward. Hands up. I think and almost say it out loud. Hands up, the old guard says. I know what they're doing in the other cell. The blindfold, the click of the handcuffs, and the guards take Ali out, pushing and kicking him. I toss and turn and follow them in my head as Ali is taken downstairs, dragged 19 steps to the right, down 19 stairs, and delivered to the interrogators. Under his blindfold, Ali will count the pairs of shoes in the room, four, six, eight, formal shoes that are thick with blood, polished by blood. The whipping will start soon after the curses. If the man they called Mongrel is there, the interrogation will last longer and be much more painful. In his vocabulary, fucking murdering savages means Kurds. It is rumored that Mongrel's brother was killed in the Kurdistan 30 years ago during one of the uprising. Five, six whiplashes and Ali will think about concentration camps, pyramids, the Great Wall of China, and will not feel the weeping anymore. I hope. The number of cracks on the wall is 305 today. I sneak a pen out from under my army blanket and turn some, take some paper folded eight times from my underwear. My dear students, I write, lying on my left on a stinking bed. All I have been able to do for you is to secretly teach you our Kurdish alphabet, our literature, and our history. Please, children, please remember your heritage and pass it on. Dear little ones, never allow this knowledge to steal from you the joy of childhood. May you keep the joy of youth in your minds forever. It may be the one and only investment you're going to use when the agony of earning the bread and butter dominates you, my sons, and the sin of being the second sex overpowers you, my daughters. When you're picking flowers in the valleys to make crowns for your children, tell them about the purity and happiness of childhood. Remember not to turn your back to your flowers, to dreams, to love, to music, to poetry, and to Kurdistan's magical nature. Get together, sing the songs, and recite the poetry as we used to. Jule Chokai 
In me, there was a prisoner, not used to the clanking of his chains. I recite aloud, clinging to the door of my cell, a cell that is only five steps, wall to wall. A lamp in a metal grate is grating spread, sorry. A lamp in a metal grating spreads dull light and the steel toilet of my solitary room stinks. Shamlu's poems again, Ali asks. Through the bar, he looks so dried up, so thin, so weak. What could be more healing, I ask, staring at the brick walls. I have not seen myself in ages. Mirrors don't exist in prison, but I'm sure I don't look any better than Ali. Read your own poetry. Oh, I'm not a poet, just a teacher who loves poetry, I say. Hey, did I tell you I had a student with the name Ali? What would you do to them, Kakfarzad? Ali's voice is shaking. His cheeks and eyes are bruised, and his muscles are hardly moving. What would you do, Kakfarzad, if you could do anything you wanted to these torturers? I think about this question for quite a long time and say in a serious tone, I'd send them to rehab. Ali forces a laugh. Does your foot still hurt? My entire body does, Aligyan, but this is the pain of a nation and the cure too, so it's not all that bad. I know under the prison gown, Ali's body is a patchwork of wounds. Make sure you don't forget us, Mama Sa, when you're free, Ali says, his voice getting fainter. Even though his body is stronger than mine, I know he's too frail to stand or speak much longer. I spent 18 days in an emergency room after my wounds from interrogation became infected. I was not allowed to sleep or to use the washroom more than twice in 24 hours, kept in the humidity of a cold lockdown where all I had to wrap around me was a gray, once white mat, which made me more sick. They have played football with Ali too. The interrogators, the players, stand in the corners of the room, tell the enemies of God to strip, kick our bodies around, curse us and our ethnicity, kick our heads, kick us harder when it's already injured, threaten our families, threaten to rape us, and we cannot help the screams that satisfy them so much. Do not worry, Aligyan, your cries are not a sign of weakness. I write down what I cannot say to his face. I have seen a human's birth. Cries and struggles are the first signs of life, not of weakness. A mountain begins with his first rock and a human with the first pain. I do the day Azizam Shobechawitbam lie, lie, lie. I sing Ali's favorite lullaby. He once said he used to sing it for his babies. I wonder if he will still see them again this week or if he might wait until the bruises on his face at least heal a bit. <laughs> Ali weeps and I sing louder. No, 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 no. 
My lullaby passes through the concrete walls. Other prisoners, political or non-political, are quiet. My lullaby soothes them, even though it is in Kurdish and most of them don't speak the language. Lie. Lie. Eighteen, nineteen, twenty. I'm counting the cracks on the ceiling. My lawyer is presenting some documents to the judge. It is hard to breathe here. This room is dense. It stinks as if the walls are made of corpses. The judge leaves his seat and is walking to the door that convicts cannot use. It is only for him. The attached light brown desks divide his honor space from that of the non-honored ones. Farzad is absolutely innocent in this regard, Your Honor, my lawyer says for the third time. He is not part of any political group, Your Honor. Nothing in Kamangar's judicial files and records demonstrate any links to the charges of terrorism brought against him. There are only three of us in the room, and five minutes has passed, but the judge seems not to be hearing the lawyer. He stops, and I wait for him to say something. He comes back tucks some paper under his arm, and walks to the door again. I'm going for my afternoon prayer. Your afternoon prayer? I shout. He stops. I? I have been in prison for 845 days. The words jump out of me. For 212 of those days, I was not allowed to contact my family, have a lawyer, or even know what my crime was supposed to be. The judge touches his gray beard, what I think he houses dead mice. He takes a step towards the door. After I was proved innocent of all the charges of bombing and accusation, this new accusation came up. They didn't even bother to make up a single document to support this. Every step he takes toward the door makes me speak louder. All my wounds hurt when I limp towards his long desk. The convulsions in my arms and leg, courtesy of the electrocution, get viciously frequent, but they can't stop me. The judge almighty does not hear me. Worms wriggling in his ear halt my words from getting through. He's holding the door's handle. Absolutely zero evidence has been presented against Kamangar, your honor, zero. The lawyer says, the judge looks back, looks around, and at the camera installed over his high chair. Listen, he whispers, the intelligence service wants you dead. It's not my fault. And he turns his back, leaving the room promptly through his private door. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's, it's not your fault. I scream, and the echoes scream back at me. My lawyer is motionless. A security guard runs and presses my wrist against my back. I wasn't speaking with my hands. I say softly, feeling almost numb. Hush, bra, hush. The young, dark-skinned security guard whispers. He's short, but sturdily built, and his tough look shows that he's a hard-working village boy, probably an obligatory military service here. The lawyer shakes his head and waves his hand in the air, what, what, what kind of persecution was that, five minutes? Only five minutes behind closed doors and not even a word of explanation? Not even one word? There is no evidence, zero, zero evidence. Hush, Farzad, hush, I think. Not because there isn't much to say, but because speaking is terrorism, a sin, a threat to national security, and animosity towards God. I am being brought to the door when I refused to seek asylum abroad, I thought I'd be a village teacher and spend my days amongst my people, my people who need me. I thought if I stayed in my own country, I would not be labeled a terrorist. The door shuts again.
Ali's daughters are here again to perform the latest gymnastic moves for their father, despite everyone else in the room and all the chairs, despite the bruises on their father's face. I realize now that these children aren't just innocently entertaining their fathers. I try not to stare at the admirable pure souls in small bodies performing their fabulous moves, but I can't help it. Mother is staring at me with her aging features. Please die again, please stop protesting in front of the prison, I say when the 15 minute visitation is over. If they do anything to do your mother, I want to repeat it again for the thousandth time, but this lump in my throat. Sitting by the other people makes me feel stronger, Bawanam, mother says. I get to console families whose loved ones have been hanged. Hanged? Hey, you, you don't have to worry, she says. Your letters are widely spread in the country. National and international campaigns have started to save you. The guard is unlocking the door for her to leave. You're different from other prisoners, Farzad. You have a voice. You'll be free soon. The door is waiting, open only for her. She speaks louder. I receive calls and letters from people that I don't even know, from Kurdish people in Turkey, Syria, Iraq. She runs to me, hugs me, and slides something into my pocket. I remember the lullaby late at night. The homemade chocolates mother gave me are by my bed. She also had a pen and paper for me. The number of cracks before me are infinite today. I take a few deep breaths and write, no, I will not let them kill me inside. After all, the long walls here can stop me from seeing the moon and stars. Being enclosed behind the bars doesn't stop me from knowing that out there, the Alier mountain is dancing slowly to the sound of the tambour. My nights aren't just walls, not just counting cracks. The cricket is my witness. She knows that despite the injustice inside the prison, the day and night do not steal each other's turn in their freedom. Chocolates melt in my mouth. Delicious, the best taste in years. I continue scribbling. The newspapers are blank. The walls are spies. Television, the greatest liar, speaking off limit. But I will eventually get out of here. Now sleep, sleep. Not because it's time to sleep, but because being awake is a crime. Footsteps, the same heavy boots. I'm not shaking, and I smile at this victory, at the courage writing insinuates in me. The pen and paper are quickly placed under the army blanket. They reach my ward. Hands up, I think, and almost say it out loud. Hands up, the old guard says. What, after our interrogation? I say to the old guard, whom I have known for exactly 154 days, I speak informally to him, for he knows I have a pen here and pretends that he doesn't. We have one thing in common, counting the days, the guard counting towards his retirement from a job he hates and me to a future that could go either way. We both try to keep our sanity by adding numbers. Number A1332, the old man says, I see two huge men behind the familiar faces. The usual pushes follow, the usual handcuffs and blindfolds, but not the same path, not the same number of steps. Arim show chan show all is in dula your own Ari wak bok chai bi o all is in 
Without my blindfold, I can see my Kurdish friends. Shirin, Ali, Mehdi, and Farhad are followed by three guards each. We are in Evan Prison's yard, and dawn is breaking. Now, with their arrival, 25 armed guards stood all together, surrounding five handcuffed prisoners of mixed gender. I look at the sky. The sun is checking to see if it's not counter-revolutionary to rise today. I say, and the other four handcuffed people force high laughs that seem hysterical. The guards push us toward the west corner of the yard. Underneath the punches and kicks that lead us along the way, I realize that Farhad is also limping. We're both lagging behind. Were you a football too? I feel a corner of my lip go up in a half smile. What? Farhad asks. Before he was arrested, he did not have that many great hair, that much great hair in his mustache and brows. Did you meet Mongrel? Did they play football with you too? Oh, I guess football was your special treat. They were boxers with me. I laugh aloud and the guard behind me hits my back with his rifle butt. You know what? I turn back and the angry bearded guard points the gun at my chest. I sense death. I become daring. The sun will rise regardless. I receive a slap and think that the miserable bastard doesn't know how meaningless he and his guns are. There is nothing left to be scared of. The guards are waiting for an order and we stand still. Chocolates. I reach into my pocket with difficulty with cuffed hands and take them on. Have some, I say to the tallest guard, the one on my right. The bearded guard tries to hit me again, this time with his gun, but the tall one holds him back. Unable to move forward, he swears at me, at the other four prisoners, at all the Kurds. Rise, son, rise and be our witness, Shirin shouts and receives more blows and curses. I'd like to tell Shirin I had a student whose name was Shirin, who couldn't speak much Farsi either. Shirin had written in her letter that she was interrogated in Farsi, a language she never learned because she never went to school. The sun is at no rush to rise. What's wrong with sharing chocolates? Nobody responds. I limp towards Shirin, whose guards make nervous moves while listening carefully to their rustling wireless devices. Can I take two, she asks. Take ten, sister. No more diet for you and me. I wink surprised at myself for being so calm. Shireen holds a chocolate in her mouth and closes her eyes at the taste. I know how she feels. This is our graduation ceremony, you know, she says as I hobble towards the other prisoners, passing the chocolates around. Oh, with honor, I add, and feel in a way relieved that the everlasting humiliation of torture ends today. The other prisoners take chocolates while the guards refuse. They, with all their worldly freedom, would not be able to enjoy the taste. I still haven't finished giving them all away when the guards pull us back to tie all the four male prisoners handcuffed together from behind with short lengths of rope and tell us to walk in a line. Around the corner, in the main square, there are five chairs on a high stand. You can't murder us like this. Where are our lawyers? Mehdi is struggling. We haven't even said goodbye to our families. And screaming, hopeless fighting. Who ordered our uh, death sentence? Why? One of the guards kicks Mehdi in the groin. I remember, I had a student named Mehdi. Same pain, with long, bloody nail claws at my heart. Everything seems me f calmly familiar in a curious way. Even Mehdi's face, crimson with anger and pain, looks familiar. Suddenly, the fatigue I had not paused to feel conquers my body, dulls my senses, nullifies me. When we are up on the seats and the guards are tying our feet, I see Ali silently crying and bidding his lower lips, lie, lie. Lie. La, 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 la. Kajul, chow, kajol, 
The curses and blows cannot stop us from singing. None of the guards speak our language, nor can they be soothed by the lullaby. more ropes. These are placed around our necks and the chairs are kicked away. This is just a graduation from this world. I know the media here will announce that five terrorists have been hanged. But I also know that the sun will rise, that the cracks will one day bring the prison walls down, that the students will one day continue to learn openly their history. On the ropes, the chocolates melt in our mouth.